dunk or block. D-Wade choosing Utah over Miami is more heartbreaking than A-Rod and J-Lo breaking up. Oh, nothing was more heartbreaking for me than, than A-Rod and J-Lo breaking up. I know. I know. Uh, um, so, so block. No, it was not. Hey guys, welcome on into Drinks with Binks. I'm Julie Stewart Binks. On this show, I love having a beverage and sitting down with some of the most badass women in sports that are dancing on the glass ceiling. And today's guest is the epitome of that. She was hired as the first full-time female as an NBA analyst. She works with the Brooklyn Nets, also is a host for FS1, CBS Sports, Yes Network. I'm very excited to be able to welcome in a woman I haven't seen for a while, but I certainly watch all the time on TV. I am toasting to Sarah Kustak. Thank you so much for joining us here today. We've got a little tea and how are you doing? Truly amazing. Now that I get to see you again, it couldn't be better. It has been a while. The last time Sarah and I saw one another was we were playing soccer with NYC FC's training facility that had been opened up, which was uh, a great, we were just saying a great installation for like media to come and cover something, which would normally be very boring, the opening of a training ground, but they gave us private, well, lessons from Patrick Vieira, Arsenal legend. So it was lessons. We had a whole cool. kit. We had cleats. We were, we were the real deal. We looked the part. I don't know if we played the part, but we looked the part at least. We definitely looked the part. I think that we, we probably look the part better doing what we do now, which is sports broadcasting. And for you, of course, you've been doing a great job with the Brooklyn Nets and we have so much to talk about with them. They are a very fascinating team and Let's just get to the very big breaking news that we are shooting this on a Monday. But of course, this is airing on a Wednesday. Kevin Durant going out of the game yesterday, injured. What's what's going on with him? What's the status? I I, well, I wish we knew or had more information um, to tell. Now, he had missed 23 games, uh, 24 of 25 games before coming back. And that was just his fourth game back um, from a hamstring injury. Now, he got need in the in his thigh. And so they, they're saying it's day-to-day. Um, they have been overly cautious, as you can imagine, with trying to make sure that everyone is healthy as they gear towards the postseason. It's still taking some time to get everyone on the floor together. Um, but it, it's it's a wait-and-see situation. I know they'll be doing more imaging today, the next few days, um, and kind of get a feel. But hopefully it's something where they are being more overly cautious and keeping him out. Right. As you mentioned, it has been difficult to get sort of all the guys on the court at the same time. We're talking also about Kyrie Irving and James Harden. Uh The three of them, including Katie, have only played seven games together on a scale of one to five. Let's just say one being lowest, five being highest. What's sort of the, the panic level or the concern level? Let's just say concern. I don't, I, you know what? I don't even think it, there's much, I, I'm not sure concern is the right word. I just think it's not ideal in any circumstances, as, as you know, with any team and players, you'd want to be together on the floor as much as possible, especially when it's a new group. But I think that they have enough trust in their past playing together, whether it was Team USA, whether it was Feel in the early part of the season between Kevin and Kyrie. Kyrie and James have spent a lot of time on the floor together. Um, and above all else, they they're very talented obviously some of the most prolific scorers that we have seen in the game but they have such a high basketball IQ and collectively I think the the instincts of these guys how they've all been able to play together is something that I don't think there is a high level of concern because the area that players have been able to flourish mm-hmm. has been a lot of the complimentary guys and some of the, the people that are going to play important key pieces around Kevin Kyrie and James. And for those reasons, I think the opportunity and experience those guys have had throughout the course of the season will hopefully pay dividends. Right. And uh, yeah, you mentioned some of those players and some of them are like Blake Griffin and DeAndre Jordan. And we don't even talk about them. We talk about those other three guys. Uh, They are from afar. The Nets are like this, this enigma of a team. Like it's such an interesting, like real housewives of Brooklyn, I guess. (laughs) Um, I guess it would be my analogy maybe of, of what's going on, but you're there, you're, you're around the team. What's an analogy movie TV show you would give, this group of guys that you've been able to cover this year? 
That's an excellent question, especially since I'm not a big movie or TV buff, shockingly, <laughs> being in this business. Um, I always think of, so many of the guys are big on the Avengers movies. Like, I always think of the Avengers, of all of these different superheroes uh, coming mm -hmm. together. And I need to dive into the plot of that movie. But, but I do. I think it's um, different players with uh, some extraordinary talents and all trying to fit together and come together for one common yeah. goal. And, and so um, that's, that's more of the way I view it because the one thing that stood out, Julie, they really love each other and care about each other no. and play for each other. And I think, I think that's something that that's the unknown before you come into a season with a lot of different personalities and people, not just gelling in the chemistry on the floor, but it's off the floor. And I think that's been, to me, one of the most special things to watch is just the, the type of camaraderie and chemistry they have off the floor, um, which has been right. really cool to see. And speaking of that chemistry, like we other news that we were going to start with before Katie's injury was the fact that LaMarcus Aldridge has retired, recently wow. retired, seven time all star. And it, you know, because of an irregular heartbeat, which is really good that he's taking care of his body and, and knows, you know, when to to call it quits at this point. What was sort of the pulse around and sorry, no pun intended, but around the the team when the news came out? It, I think in many regards, it was shocking, surprising, um, but really supportive for LaMarcus himself. And he, he said a seven time all star, five time all NBA. I think he's had a Hall of Fame career. Um, it, and the team was really excited about at this point of his career, um, the skill set and where he's at, what he could bring to this group and how he could hopefully ultimately help them um, to contend for a title. And so I think it, more than anything, um, it, it was just such a heartfelt support and appreciation for mm -hmm. him for putting his health first. Cause I know it was an easy decision um, and that's challenging uh, to think about. Uh, career and a lifetime that you've poured into the game of basketball to think about at this point, uh, stepping away, especially how much he had been embraced and was excited about joining this team. But I, I think all the guys who know him and care about him and love him are just glad that he was able to think about his family, think about his future um, of him as an individual and him as a person. Right. It's great to have that perspective yeah. at that point in your career. Now, Steve Nash, Canadian, yeah. legend um also soccer fan and he is the coach of the brooklyn nets he's had to deal with many different situations you've seen lots of coaches you've covered lots of coaches what makes steve nash unique in how he has handled this year Julie, I think you pointed to the most important thing of how many different things that he's hand had to handle we talked about the injuries and players being in and out, add in the pandemic and a compressed season and the uniqueness of everything that goes into this year um, that no one has experienced. And I know is an enormous challenge for all of these teams and organizations and coaches. Um, so for him as a rookie head coach, I have never seen someone that is so even keel and composed mm. and just willing to be resilient, but with the same attitude day in, day out, regardless. And uh, you know, as a fellow Canadian, you know, but his Hall of Fame career and what he was as a player, but I think so much of that has allowed him to resonate and connect with the players. And what stood out to me is how he has such a great feel of when he needs to interject and when he really needs to lead and to guide and, and to be that head coach. And when he allows so many of these veterans and these players to problem solve for themselves in certain situations. Um, and they have such an enormous amount of respect for him. Uh, but you can see his growth throughout the course of the year. And it's, it's just been really, it's been really fun to watch him as a coach. He's been a pleasure for us in the media, which is always appreciated. Mm -hmm. um, but, but it is that steady composure that I think has been really impressive. A steady composure in a really difficult season yeah. dealing with COVID and dealing with injuries, dealing with personalities is this like the hardest season you would uh, imagine a coach would have to go through? 
I can't imagine a harder one. Um, and I'm sure for the, as many other years and seasons and things that coaches have been dealing with, but just across the board for all 30 head coaches, um, just everything that they have gone through with these teams, um, with all the travel protocols and the health protocols, uh, everything too that you think about, not only what these players are physically dealing with, but thinking about the mental health um, that everyone mm-hmm. has been um, really strained in, in handling everything everything that has gone along, um, not just with the pandemic, but also um, socially and and so much of the social unrest that Mm. has been going on throughout the country. I think there's just been um, just layer upon layer of instances and things that have been very heavy um, for these coaches, for the teams itself. And so I I give all credit and kudos to all of these individuals and everything that they've been handling. Right. Especially for Steve Nash as a rookie head coach yeah. that uh, there's no playbook no, for a year like no. this. Um, and, and oftentimes <laughs> you can ask people, what about this? How do you handle this? What in, in many cases there isn't there. There isn't anything to fall back on. Also, you make it sound like I'm like BFF with Steve Nash. So let's keep that up. Be like, yeah, me and Steve Nash go way back because we're from <laughs> the country of 33 million people up there. <laughs> That's a okay. Okay, we have a whole lot more that we want to get to with Sarah Kustak when we return on Drinks with Thinks, including her journey to becoming the first full time female NBA analyst. We'll have a whole lot more, and that's when we return on Drinks with Thinks. Hey guys, welcome back to Drinks with Thanks. I'm JSB, and today I'm toasting with my tea. Uh, I just feel like I had to be more a rose. I also have an Alexis <laughs> Rose mug here right now, but to my wonderful guest, Sarah Kustak, who is the first ever full time female NBA analyst, which is such an illustrious title to hold. And for you, you were with the Brooklyn Nets. You uh, you go from being a reporter to an analyst. What was sort of the catalyst at, at that time to being able to be promoted to a role that had been always held by a man? Uh, the original catalyst, Julie, was a scheduling glitch um, that all of our former analysts, this was a few years before I was named the lead analyst, but all of our um, all of our analysts, regular analysts, um, had other assignments going on. And so there was one game open and my producer, um, Frank DeGrace, my boss, John Filippelli, um, at some point, I can't remember who called me first. But they just asked, hey, we know you know your stuff. We listen to you every day doing this. Would you be interested in calling this game? And I think the incredible part that we see now is there are so many females getting different opportunities like this. Mm -hmm. Uh, But I'll never forget at the time. I mean, I was just filling in for one game and we had interviews on NBA TV and write ups. And it it, it was such a... um, groundbreaking thing to be an analyst on the Nets game. Um, And then fast forward, I was able to do a few more games. Then the next year, it it went pretty well. So they said, okay, we're going to put you on a few more games. We did uh, a couple three-man booth games, and then it kind of grew the next few years. And um, then they had decided to promote me to this position. And uh, it was a dream come true. I mean, it really Mm -hmm. is one of those things as – I'm sure you can imagine just when you think about the things that you get to do in your career that match not only things you love and you're passionate about, but it fits the bill of where it challenges you and allows you to grow. Um, It really was a a tremendous um, honor and also a responsibility. I have said this often to make sure you do a competent enough job that others are getting those opportunities after you. Mm -hmm. And so I'm just I'm just really thankful to be in this position. And there's not a day that goes by that I I don't think, wow, this is this is really cool and something that I never would have imagined. I can't imagine how surreal that moment would have been like, because having not seen anyone in that role before getting handed the baton to take it on in that moment. And then, as you mentioned, all the write ups and and the pressure, as you said, you know, you want to you wanted to perform for an entire gender and be able to to carry that on your shoulders. That's a lot of pressure. How do you think that things have changed from when you first started to now doing games in terms of how people respond to having a female in the booth covering NBA? I think that it's been tremendous to see just how much I feel like things have changed throughout the course of just the last two, three years. Um, There's still a long way to go and a lot of ground to cover, but not just in broadcasting. I mean, obviously you see what Doris Burke 
does. Um, you could look at the coaching staffs. You could look at front offices, mm-hmm. um, you know, across the board, um, you know, Candace Parker with TNT. The, the list goes on. I mean, I can go to all the different networks. And now it is a regularity um, to just yes. see before it was not even a regularity to see a woman talking about a man's sport. That was a really not, it was very much of a novelty to see that or say, oh, well, what did she do and why is she now? I think it's something that we all are very accustomed to seeing um, and it's continuing to grow. And I think just that respect level, what I, what I hope and what I'd like to think is that these next generations coming up, because I often see that even in the players, like the respect of the players, respect of coaches, I mm-hmm. think it's less about those within the game. Um, and sometimes it's those outside of the game uh, that it, it takes a second for them to catch up and realize that it should not matter on gender. Um, you know, it, it's more based on knowledge and about preparation and insight uh, and experience. But I think we've seen, it, it's been really exciting for me because I think we have seen a definite shift in the volume of women doing different roles that before I think were relegated more just to men. And I hope it continues to grow even more. Mm-hmm. And it really does help having an advocate that puts you in in that position and yeah. gives you that opportunity, as you mentioned, your boss is there. So then when, when younger women ask you, I'm sure you get messaged all the time, you know, I want to be an NBA analyst. Like what, what is the, the number one piece of advice you'd give someone? I, you know, I always start with, I think it starts with preparation. Um, it starts with a love for me. I think you have to have a love for the game because for let's say an NBA analyst specifically or a basketball analyst um, for me, so much comes, I, I had played, um, you know, so a lot of my background, a lot of my knowledge in some ways I played, I coached them from those experiences. But then after that, it's, it's watching film and watching the game and wanting to continue to learn um, as you watch things and sit in practices and um, talk to coaches, talk to players. But I, I think so much of it does come down to the preparation and, and in this business and in anything with with television, it's having a thick skin. And I think your preparation then gives you the confidence to know there are mm-hmm. going to be critiques. There's going to be criticism. There are going to be people that, you know, don't like your opinion or thoughts just based mm-hmm. on the fact that you're a woman. And then in other ways, it's a very subjective business. So um, I think it's just the the idea that you need to be comfortable um, with the fact that not everyone is going to love you. Not everyone's going to agree with you. Um, but if you put in the work, you put in the preparation. Um, hopefully at the end of the day, what's most important is that you feel confident about who you are, the job you're doing um, and the right. work that you've put in. And speaking of preparation, we saw Jamie Erdahl this year with CBS Sports when the mics went out with uh, her, her, you know, analyst and play by play. And, you know, she just swooped in and was able to do it. And it is sort of that moment of like, you know, I've been doing this. I'm, you know, I'm working hard every week. I can do that next step in that next role. And then in the same point, I love what you said about like, you have to love it because if you don't love it, you why like you're gonna hate it people always ask me they're like oh what you know do you like doing what you're doing it's like yes like you have to love it or this would suck right yes, like this yeah, would just because- be like at, like working anywhere you know and, if you didn't and, like it and people can tell that like i always think that with viewers um you know it re- it resonates if you are enjoying your job if you are being genuine if you are authentically who you are and you're loving and passionate about uh what it is mm-hmm. you're doing like people feed off that and that's what they want to see if i'm watching someone i want them to be excited about what they're doing or what they're talking about um and there's a lot of sacrifices that that go along with it and so if you don't love it uh it would make it right. that much tougher Right. And then those sacrifices seem a whole lot more um, than they would be if you were obsessed with it. All right. We have a whole lot more we want to get to with Sarah Kustak, including some incredible NBA storylines and whether she wants to dunk or block them. What does that mean? I don't know. She doesn't know. We will all find (laughs) out coming up after this break on Drinks with Thanks.
Welcome back to Drinks with Thanks. I'm JSB, joined by NBA analyst for the Brooklyn Nets, also host on FS1, CBS Sports, and Yes Network, Stara Kusak. We are going to play a game here on the show as we like to, and it is called Dunk or Block. I'm going to give Sarah a statement about the, something in the NBA, and then she's either going to dunk it, agree, or block it, disagree. Let's get it going. Okay. LeBron James and AD are nearing return. Dunker block. The healthy Lakers are still the title favorites. Uh, I'm going to dunk that. I'm going to dunk that. They're the defending champs. You've got to respect that. And the Lakers have looked impressive without them. Um, So absolutely. I think what they went through together and winning a title. Yeah, I'm going to dunk that. I would still have them as my favorites. Assuming Ooh, assuming would. LeBron and AD are back healthy. Yes, very big what if. Okay, Dunker Block. Jazz have the NBA's best record. The Jazz team is better than the Malone Stockton version. Oh, Dunk this is hard. Block. I'm going to have to block that because I have so much reverence for the Malone Stockton version. I know they have the best. I know they have the best record of the regular season thus far. Um, And maybe that's just because that was my childhood growing up, although I grew up in Chicago. So I I felt good about my Chicago Bulls and and MJ and Scotty and the likes. Uh, But no, I would not. I would not put them ahead of I would block that they are better than the jazz version. Uh, with I think that's Stockton. probably the objectively correct answer to Dunker Block because yeah, they haven't made a finals yet, so we'll have to see. Okay, so, uh, final one here. Speaking of the Jazz, Dwayne Wade reportedly became a part owner of the Jazz last week after previously negotiating with Miami. Dunk or Block, D. Wade choosing Utah over Miami is more heartbreaking than A. Rod and J. Lo breaking up. Oh, nothing was more heartbreaking for me than than A Rod and J Lo breaking up. I know, I uh, know. Um, so so block. No, it was not. And um, I'm excited. I I grew up in Chicago. Obviously, Dwayne Wade and I were the same year, and um, I've thoroughly enjoyed following. Him. So I'm excited what he could do with the Jazz. I think the Jazz yeah. could use use his fingerprints on some things and the impact that he could make. Um, and then maybe they can get to that Malone Stockton era. Maybe one day. Yeah. But, um, but more but importantly, yeah, now, you've got, now more importantly, you've got me thinking about how heartbroken I am about Ava I, and J-Lo. The fact I, that they broke up twice it. is what's just really crushing me. It's tough. It's, Maybe it, is there a chance for a reunion? I don't know. No, you can't. You can't, can't. If someone dumps <laughs> you twice, you can't go back a third time. It's you can't. I don't, and I believe that J Lo's in charge of this. It has to be. I mean, I know. So if he, if she wants to take a rod back, I would go back. No, she to can't. J-Lo. She won't. She's too. That lady. She's got too much going on to deal with that. I'm sorry. I know you're wearing a Yankees hat right now. It crushed me because I just was like, well, they look so perfect. But then again, who? I don't know. I don't know them like I know Steve Nash. So it's it's tough. Like, <laughs> you're not I besties. Just, you're not besties with them. We're not. We're not besties <laughs> um, yet. But we're getting. Well, well, I'm sure we'll get there. It's inevitable. Uh, this has been an amazing episode of Dunk or Block here with Sarah Kuzak, and we have a whole lot more to come after this break. So don't go anywhere. Hey guys, we've had an awesome time drinking and banking with Sarah Kustak here on Drinks with Banks. And one quick question before you go, where can we find you next? Uh, you can find me on the Yes Network calling Brooklyn Nets games. Um, also, I'm on Twitter at Sarah Kustak, S-A-R-A-H-K-U-S-T-O-K, and at Instagram at S-G Kustak. My middle name's Grace. Thank you so much for joining us here today. Keep on kicking some ass and inspiring women all around the world in the sports world and beyond. Uh, Guys, you know where to find us. We are on every social channel, but most importantly on YouTube at Fubo Sports. Check out all of our episodes and you can rewatch this one there. We will see you guys next week. Until next time, bottoms up, bitches. Bitches.